Hello, soulmates, and welcome to another Commander Abridged. Tonight we got three monocolor decks and a four color deck, so it's gonna be a dynamic one. Let's take a look at tonight's players and the decks that they brought. Going first in turn order is CJ playing Yodora Grave Gardener. This list is a mono green combo deck using Yodora's synergy with morph creatures. It is also heavily inspired by Commander Theory's budget monocolor powerhouse commanders episode, so a little shout out to them. Second up is Peter playing Brea Ethereum Sculptor, a value-centric artifact deck looking to flood the board with threats such as Planeswalkers, tons of tokens, big fatties, or combo enablers. Third up is me playing the partner pairing of Galanra Caller of Wirewood and Kodama of the East Tree. This is my Timmy Turner list, big ol' mono green win cons with some mildly brainy untapped synergies for drawing as many cards as possible off of Galanra's mana ability. Finally, there's James playing Corlash, Heir to Blackblade, a Swamps Matters deck looking to play as many swamps as possible, utilizing cards that benefit from those swamps, including Corlash himself. Let's get into it. CJ starts off the game with a Forest and then passes the turn. Peter starts off with an island, then plays a Mana Crypt. He's not done yet though because he taps out for a Chromatic Lantern and then passes after it resolves. I play a Forest and cast a Findhorn Elves and pass the turn. And James plays a Swamp and then passes. CJ plays a Forest and casts a Viridian Zealot. He passes the turn. Peter untaps and Mana Crypt triggers during his upkeep, so he rolls a die calling evens and passes the vibe check taking no damage. He continues on by casting Duretti Scrap Savant, activating its plus two ability right away. He discards a Mirror Retriever and a Semblance Anvil and draws two cards. He plays a Mystic Monastery as his land for the turn and then passes. I start off with a Forest and then tap out for Galanra Caller of Wirewood, casting it from the Command Zone. With nothing else, I pass the turn. James untaps and in his upkeep, I Gromit Mug Mug. <laughs> the Gromit Mug the Mug. Gromit <laughs> <laughs> James plays a Cabal Stronghold as his land for the turn, then casts a Walking Atlas and passes to CJ. CJ starts his turn and we all owe. Oh. Oh. Uh, oh. 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 CJ plays a forest as his land for the turn and casts an evolutionary leap, passing. Peter untaps and Mana Crypt triggers in his upkeep again, so he chooses odds as he rolls this time, wins again, kinda sus. He casts Antiquities War, which gets a lore counter as it enters the battlefield. Peter looks at the top five cards of his deck and reveals a Commander Sphere, which goes into his hand as the other four go on the bottom of his library in a random order. He then activates Duretti, discarding Shroom the Hegemon to draw a card. He plays an island as his land for the turn and passes. I play a Moss Wart Bridge as my land for the turn and when it enters, the Hideaway ability on it triggers, so I exile one card under it from the top four cards of my library, putting the rest on the bottom. I follow that up with an Arbor Elf, then a Scavenging Ooze, and I pass to James. James plays a Swamp as his land for the turn, then plays an Expedition Map. Suggesting some instant speed plays, he decides to pass the turn over to CJ. Turn four starts off with a Kazandu Nectar Pot from CJ, who misses his land drop and has no other plays, passing the turn. At the end step, I activate the Scavenging Ooze, exiling the Mere Retriever out of Peter's graveyard. I gain one life and put a plus one plus one counter onto the Scooze as the ability resolves, then Peter starts his turn. He untaps and in his upkeep, Mana Crypt triggers. He chooses odds on the die roll and wins it again. God damn it, dude. I, what are the odds of that? What is going odds? on? What is going on? Draw. Uh, I took stats. I'm pretty sure he has to have taken damage by now. <laughs> At the beginning of Peter's first main phase, another lore counter is added onto the Antiquities War. So he again looks at the top five cards of his library, this time revealing a Worm Coil Engine, putting it into his hand, and putting the rest on the bottom of his library. Peter casts a Smothering Tide. Ah, uh, man, I can't, I can't wait for the voiceover. I'm just like, look at this piece of shit. <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna be super great. <laughs> 
That shit activates Doretti's plus two ability, discarding Worm Coil Engine and Tezzeret Master of the Bridge to draw two cards. He then plays a Buried Ruin as his land for the turn and casts a Commander Sphere. He passes afterwards. I untap and draw, triggering the Smothering Tithe. I don't pay and Peter makes a treasure token. I cast Kodama of the East Tree from the Command Zone, utilizing all of my dorks to do so, and turning Gilanra into a Galeranra. <laughs> I'm gonna go one, two, three. Tap, untap, tap. Whoa. Tap, Whoa. tap. Uh, play my other commander. All of, What's all going of on? Since I used Galanra to cast a six mana spell, I get to draw a card, which again triggers the Smothering Tithe, gaining Peter another treasure token. I play a forest as my land for the turn, which triggers Kodama. I drop in a Throne of the High City from the trigger, and then pass the turn. At my end step, James activates his Walking Atlas to drop a swamp onto the battlefield from his hand, then cracks his Expedition map to put Urborg Tomb of Yogmoth from his library into his hand, and he shuffles. In response to this, though, CJ sacrifices the Nectar Pot into Evolutionary Leap. He reveals five forests in a row, and then a Sakura Tribe Scout, which goes into his hand, while the forests go onto the bottom of his library in a random order. James goes to start his turn. He draws, triggering the Smothering Tithe, which he does not pay for, and Peter gets another treasure token. James plays the Urborg Tomb of Yogmoth as his land for the turn, then casts Corlash, heir to Blackblade, from the command zone. Pog. Yeah, he's a 5-5. Five, five. Watch out. He's just, he, like, he gets shit, and then he generates. Uh, and then... <laughs> that's, pretty, that's pretty sick. He's pretty yeah. sick, dude. Grand Jury. Yo, but if you have an, if you, if you illegally yeah, play yeah, another copy, illegal, dude... dude. But I have Mirage man. here and Phyrexian Reclamation, so watch out. Is that uh? I get Mirage make it a here, copy. I make it a copy. copy. It dies. Oh. I get Phyrexian yeah. Reclamation. Oh. <laughs> oh. I, I wow. discard it. If you don't get that, if he if he gets that, if he gets that off, he wins. Like, we it's the best it. thing. No, ever. honestly, bro. <laughs> he passes the turn. CJ draws and the tithe triggers again. He doesn't pay, so Peter gets another treasure token. CJ casts a Lotus Cobra and then plays a Forest, triggering the Lotus Cobra, so he adds a green to his mana pool and uses that to cast a Sakura Tribe Scout. He heads into combat and swings the Viridian Zealot at Doretti Scrap Savant. It does two damage, taking two loyalty counters off of Doretti. In the second main phase, Viridian Zealot is activated to destroy the Antiquities War on Peter's board. He passes, and I activate the Scavenging Ooze to exile Sharoom from Peter's graveyard, gaining me one life and putting another plus one plus one counter onto the Ooze. Peter starts with his Mana Crypt trigger, choosing evens this time, and he gets a six, yet again, not taking any damage. Wow, let us know in the comments if this is cheating. He plays a Vault of Whispers as his land for the turn, then activates Doretti's minus two ability, sacrificing a treasure to get Worm Coil Engine back from his yard onto the battlefield. He follows this up by casting Ugin the Ineffable. He uses the minus three ability right away to destroy my scavenging ooze. After this, Peter passes to me. Revenge time. Revenge time, Frank. What the freaking heck? Have you destroyed that scavenging ooze? I knew it was that. <laughs> <laughs> I knew. <laughs> yeah. I draw and Peter's Smothering Tithe triggers. I do not pay and another treasure token is created by Peter. A Quarian Rangers is then cast by me and when it enters the field, it triggers Kodama, but I do not have anything with sufficient mana value to put into play. So I tap out and I use the Quarian Ranger to bounce a forest to my hand to untap Galanra and then tap it again for the eighth green mana. I use all of that mana to cast a Verdant Force, drawing two cards because Two mana was made by Galanra, and each one will draw an individual card. I don't pay for either Smothering Tithe trigger because I am here exclusively to ball, so Peter makes two more treasure tokens. Kodama then triggers once Verdant Force enters the battlefield, and I drop in a Beast Whisperer for free. I play the Bounced Forest as my land for the turn, unable to drop anything else in with this Kodama trigger, and I cast an Instill Energy, enchanting Galanra, allowing me to untap it once a turn, again with nothing to drop in from the Kodama trigger. <laughs> dude, them fingies, though. <laughs> yeah, dude. Damn. When you and your homie try to make that static shock and it hits just right. 
I pass the turn to James, who activates the Walking Atlas again at the end of my turn to drop in a Hagra Brood Pit onto the battlefield. Now, we will take this opportunity to preempt some comments here and clarify that, yes, this is a rules mistake, albeit a pretty unintuitive one. So technically, Hagra Mauling does not count as a land in hand for this activation. So James could not have played the backside of it during the effect's resolution. It would, however, count as a land for certain other effects, such as Crucible of Worlds, while Mauling is in his graveyard, though. MDFCs are kind of weird. Our bad, but luckily this does not ultimately affect the outcome of this game, so no worries. James untaps, and in his upkeep, the Verdant Force triggers, so I get a 1-1 Saperling Lens Wipe token. After his draw, Smothering Tithe triggers. Is it tax fraud if you don't pay for this? Let us know in the comments, please. James does not pay, making another treasure token for Peter. Malakir Meyer is played as James's land for the turn, and he casts a Douthy Embrace, allowing him to give a creature shadow until the end of turn for two black mana. He uses this activation right away to give Korlash shadow, then enters combat and swings the bing at Doretti Scrap Savant. With no way to block, Doretti takes seven damage and dies. After combat, James passes right through his second main phase, and the turn goes to CJ. CJ untaps, and I get a 1-1 Saproling from Verdant Force. Then he draws, and Smothering Tithe triggers again, which does not get paid for again, and Peter makes a treasure token again. God, I hope you have like 400 of those. Um, oh, fuck. <laughs> CJ plays a Birds of Paradise, then casts a Morph Creature, which scares the shit out of Peter. I'm also going to morph in a Mysterious card. <gasps> <laughs> <laughs> With nothing else, he passes the turn. Peter's untap and upkeep happens. I make another lens wipe and mana crypt triggers. Peter calls even this time and gets a one, finally taking some fucking damage, which for those of you keeping track at home is literally the first bit of damage dealt to a player this entire game. He taps his commander's sphere for a blue mana, then sacrifices it to draw a card. He casts a cost reduced Thran Dynamo, keeping the blue floating. Thranial Dynamo. Thranial. Thranial. Please <laughs> call me Thran. <laughs> Please, my father was Thranial. <laughs> <laughs> Using that blue mana and a little bit more, he casts Shimmer Dragon, then activates Ugin's plus one ability. He exiles the top card of his library face down and creates a 1 1 spirit token. He casts Brea Ethereum Sculptor from the Command Zone, which creates two 1-1 one, one Flying Thopter tokens, which are blue as it enters the battlefield, which are anime boys, according to Peter. He passes the turn. I untap and Verdant Force triggers on my upkeep, and in response to this trigger, Peter casts a Drown in the Lock targeting the Quirion Ranger. The Ranger gets destroyed, and I make a 1-1 one, one Sapperling token when the Verdant Force trigger resolves. I then draw and pay for the Smothering Tithe trigger, preventing another treasure token from being made. In fact, I cast a Croson Grip, targeting the Smothering Tithe, liberating us once and for all from the Taxman. I cast a Rampant Growth, getting a basic forest from my library to the battlefield tapped, and with nothing else, I pass to James. He untaps, and I make a 1-1 Sapperling in his upkeep. He casts a Squelching Leeches, and then activates the Douthy Embrace to give Korlash Shadow. He heads to combat and swings Korlash at Pete, who cannot block, and takes seven Korlash commander damage. With no other plays, James passes. CJ untaps, and I make a 1-1 Saproling in his upkeep. CJ plays a forest as his land for the turn, triggering the Lotus Cobra, so he adds a green mana to his mana pool and casts Yodora Grave Gardener from the command zone. He flips over his morph creature, which is a Proteus machine. So now with Evolutionary Leap, Proteus Machine, Yodora, and the Lotus Cobra, CJ has infinite green mana allowing him to continually sacrifice Proteus Machine to the Evolutionary Leap, which triggers Yodora to bring it back from the graveyard as a forest into play, which triggers Lotus Cobra, adding a green mana to his mana pool, and then when Proteus Machine is a land, he can tap it for a mana, then morph it again and do it all over. As the evolutionary leap activations resolve, he will then also get all of the creatures from his library into his hand, and then he can cast them all with the aforementioned infinite green mana. In response to the first activation of evolutionary leap, we all see that this is an infinite, so Peter activates his shimmer dragon to draw as many cards as he can until he has no more artifacts to tap, 
and says he has no responses to the loop. So CJ plays all of his creatures and then drops in a crater hoof and there are enough creatures that were in play or however you want to work it out. We fucking die. The game is over. But here's our end game banter as a conclusion to this extremely fun and blast to play weird ass color combo game. Thanks for watching. <laughs> yeah, so I'm gonna put all the creatures onto the battlefield as well as more than likely I can gain infinite life and I can also create a hook. Um, yeah. 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 What the heck? Sheesh. Are you Man, sure I had seven seven. I was. <laughs> oh, you got the the you got the wondering if I was gonna. Yeah, I had it under the bridge. I had Mirage. You know, you know what they say, man. It's all it's all behemoth under the bridge. <laughs> Guys, I had one half of the combo with Granger. Oh. Guys, what the fuck? Damn. You guys gonna let me get there? I do love when it when it just feels like it's the last turn of the game. I like that feeling. We're all kind of in the end game, except except James. I was not. That's okay. I, I also did not feel like I, I took a I dagger know. to a gunfight, dude. <laughs> also, yeah, I mean, I could have fucking held on to the crossing grip, dude, but fuck smothering tide, okay? It's 2022. We don't need to see that shit at the fucking table. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah.